So, Brian, I'm going to start with you because I think you are right on the front lines here. Um, you're the guy handing out the iPads and the Chromebooks <laughs> yes. at Pickerington. I, and I think some of you probably have children um, who've attended the school district. One of the best recognized, highest quality school districts yeah. in the country. Very well recognized for that. You have taken away the books. We have. What's going on there? So in the last three years, we've made dramatic changes into what instruction looks like. Um, and we've not purchased any textbooks for the last three years. Not purchased any textbooks. Um, outside of those few for CCP, so Ohio State folks, we're still purchasing those. Um, <laughs> but um, what we've done is we've taken all 10,600 of our students and gone completely one-to-one -one across the entire district. One-to-one so -one meaning every, every kid. kid has their own device from preschool all the way up through 12th grade. Folks like this idea? Yes, no, yes, no, all right. You're gonna have to explain that to them. So basically what we're looking for is we're looking for how can technology improve what the teacher is doing? This is not replacing the teacher by any means. I come from actually a curriculum background. I was a curriculum coordinator for two years. I was also a teacher for 11 years. So I understand the importance of the teacher, but I also understand the significance of the technology to be able to help us personalize and differentiate instruction for all kids. What we've seen over the last two years that we've gone one-to-one -one is that we do not have the teacher up in front of the room lecturing anymore. We do not have the teacher teaching one way to the middle. We have teachers using blended learning strategies like station rotation where they're differentiating based on pre-assessment data and then using the technology to then be able to increase what the kids are doing. So this may be the high group for this standard. This may be the low group. This group is getting what they're needed, not like the traditional class when I went to school that I was bored if I already understood something or I might be completely lost if I didn't understand something. So our end all be all goal is to improve what the teacher is already doing, not replace what the teacher is doing but be able to do that through personalization and, and differentiation. Amy, your organization has helped Pickerington and other, uh, other school districts in trying to make this transition. How does it work? When does it work well? So what we try to do is find when to use the technology. So there's a lot of times when what the teacher does works well. And there's times when technology can work better for the kids. When tech technology can help differentiate, like Brian was talking about. And so we try to match the technology with the standard, with the learning outcome, and help teachers make good decisions and apply good teaching practices with the right teaching so, tool. So give me an example of a, of a place where that would work, a particular subject area. So, um, I mean, I envision like all of a sudden all the worksheets are now on the iPad. Well, let's, let's say that we're in a language arts classroom mm -hmm. and there's a writing assignment. Um, or, and it's based off of um, maybe a news article. So rather than a uh, article that was a sheet passed out, the same uh, article to all kids, now because of technology, that same article can be given to different students at different reading levels. So that's one way that you can use technology to differentiate. And then when it comes to writing, you can help kids with that writing process through the technology. So you can scaffold it. You can have um, you can have different collaborative writing groups. You can have, um, I don't know, Brian, you can feedback. jump in here and do some feedback, uh, like Google Docs was referenced earlier in the day, um, where kids can start writing. A teacher can monitor it in real time and provide feedback in real time. You can have peer reviews. Um, Dr. Anthony, this is about that individualization, right? Mm -hmm. This idea that maybe with these kinds of technologies, teachers are relieved of certain burdens that they can focus more on individual students. That's definitely a per, uh, possibility. Um, one of the things that I spend a lot of my time doing is gleaning the literature 
and helping our, um, we specifically work with students that want to become technology coaches in schools. We work with future principals. And so individualization, personalization, that is one goal that a district or that a school might be working towards. And so I don't want to just pigeonhole us just to that. I think this is a rich example of use, but uh, there are many other um, goals that schools can work towards. Um, four ways that I try to kind of pare those down is number one, schools can work towards a goal of, if we're thinking of um, a model of education, we're thinking of a traditional um, brick and mortar building, we're thinking of traditional roles for uh, teachers and administrators, uh, there may be schools that don't want to change that traditional model. They may want teachers to be more engaged with students and, um, you know, differentiation and personalization, but they still want the typical model of education. So they might just want to use technology to make things more efficient. So efficiency could be one major goal. And there are many ways that we can use technology in schools to maintain and continue the current model, but let's just think of how to make it more efficiently. It sounds like with Brian's district, though, they wanted to move beyond efficiency to actually get to um, changing instruction. And so it sounds like they had some clear articulated goals, and you can get into that in a bit, on why you all wanted to change uh, to more personalization, why you wanted to probably do more integration within uh, curricular areas, but th there's a huge category, right, volumes of uses on how we can change instruction and not just make it more efficient. So and there's, Bro, there's two the others. But what, what happened there? So really, we, we knew that we were a, a high-flying school district. You know, the state tests always, back when we were giving the OGT and those kinds of tests, we were always doing very well on those. Uh, but as we saw, we weren't doing so well on tests like the ACT or the SATs. And we noticed that um, our kids um, were, or our teachers were covering content, but our kids necessarily weren't learning content. So the question was, not necessarily how can we use the technology, but how can we use the technology as a foot in the door to modernize some of our teaching practices? And what we created was we actually created a model of blended learning that we are calling tradigital learning which is actually the best teaching practices of a traditional classroom blended with the best teaching practices of a digital classroom. So we used a lot of John Hattie's work to identify what those best practices were. So we're not saying that our kids are on devices 24 seven. No way, no how. They're on devices about 50% of the time. And any more than that, then we start to get some of the same problems that we had when everything was on paper and pencil. Uh, so really what we're looking for is being able to get down to the real true instruction and really making an, an impact on every single kid's life instead of just teaching to the middle in every single classroom. I, I know I can feel that there are people who want to comment on this. So I'm, I'm going to open it up earlier actually than usual to, to those of you who have questions and comments about that. But I, I am struck by this. I mean, I, I'm a parent. I look at this. I understand this is the trend across the country to do the one-to-one -to, -one to give these, you, your district is the largest in the state mm -hmm. of Ohio Correct. to have gone this way. You are a front runner in this. Mm -hmm. Can you assure me that you've done the right thing? Um, I, I don't know if we can ever assure that we've done the right <laughs> thing in education. Um, it's always one of those things of what's the next trend, what's the next research showing. Right, but isn't um, that, isn't that the, the risk then? You, you've taken this leap. It definitely is. Um, we spent an entire year, though, creating our technology plan. We had seven different stakeholder groups from parents to community members to teachers to principals to looking at all of the different uh, documentation and white papers and all of those different things that are saying that, you know, kids learn this way. Um, you know, they, we have this modern group of kids uh, that, you know, they go home and the, what do they do? They're on their devices, they're on their gaming stations, those types of things. Why do we take those things away from them when they're at school? Why does school have to be, you know, something that's completely different than the rest of the world to them? I'm, I'm feeling parents out here <laughs> thinking about that. Going, uh, what, what has the reaction been? I mean, you actually got into 100% um, coverage Correct. much earlier than you thought you Correct. would. Uh, your plan was for six years, I think? Six years. So the original plan was six years, and we rolled it out. To, uh, the entire district went one-to-one -one in 14 months. So, And I will be honest with you, um, 
in all, so we have 10,600 students, and I can count on my, the two hands that I've had parents that have had conversations with me that are upset about the way that we're doing things. In the aftermath. In the aftermath. After we've done all the work. We've done a lot of work of, with the personal, uh, prof um, in PR talking about this is why we're doing this. This is what it's going to look like. Your kids are not going to be bringing worksheets home anymore. Okay, Worksheets, first of all, aren't the best instructional tool anyway. So we're looking at all those different things of this is where you're going to find. You're going to find your work in Google Classroom. Kids are going to be turning things in. No, kids will not be bringing books home anymore. All of their resources are online because now we don't have an eight-year-old textbook that's outdated already. We have um, modern, current digital curriculum. So we've done a lot of work explaining this to parents and saying, this is where the resources are now going. We're investing a million dollars a year into digital content that's up to date, interactive with your kids, so that way they can be, um, have the best resources that they can possibly have in their classroom, instead of, like I said, outdated textbooks that, you know, four presidents before. Or what and have you. what do you hear from the teachers? I mean, on, on that side, do they feel that they have the support they need? Well, I think. And I know you speak with teachers a lot, so I'll let you go first, and then I have some perspective on that. Well, our teachers enjoy it. As long as they are given the chance to take the technology and mold it to fit their curriculum, teachers want to help kids. They want to reach every kid. That's why they show up to work every day. And when they are given a tool that can make the difference for their kids, they are on fire and they get excited when they're given the opportunity to actually customize their own classroom with those tools. So is so that a resource issue? Is that? I think it's, uh, it's always a challenge to find the time right. and um, have access to the professional <laughs> development. Um, but when they are given it, uh, they go gangbusters with it. Teaching teachers. We're going to see a lot of variability across districts and across buildings. And unfortunately, um, in terms of buildings within districts, there's a lot of variability in terms of how teachers are experiencing uh, technology-supported initiatives. And uh, one of the things I tell my students is we need to remember that we're not just implementing technology. We're implementing educa technology-supported educational programs. The children are the star in this. We're all just part of the supporting role. And although a lot of teachers, uh, there is some data on this, uh, are interested in the possibilities of technology. You can't read an article or turn on the TV and, and not see a commercial that gets you excited <laughs> about possibilities. But unfortunately, many, many districts have not put in the hard work that Brian's has. Um, many are not reaching out to organizations like um, ITSCO, right? Mm -hmm to help with professional development. So um, many teachers, they may be excited, but they just may, they don't know the goal, right? Mm -hmm. What was the purpose behind this? I didn't have a say in what the district was going to do. I want to use it, I just, I just don't know how. Many teachers are experiencing that. And, and that may vary also on what the teacher's experience is with technology in their own. It does, but it definitely varies on how it was, the program was in, um, conceptualized and how it was planned and the type of involvement that educational professionals had. And, in and my understanding it. is that in your year, you actually did go to the stakeholders and try uh, to. Seven different groups. We met probably 50 different times and we created our, our wonderful technology plan, which is now driving us for the, the next uh, few years into the future and we're constantly would updating this. Would, do you think your, your plan is a model for other districts? Um, I, I truly do. Um, we started out by going to the uh, Future Ready uh, Niche Summit, which is something that Ohio is going to take on here in the next couple of months. Uh, we use that as our backbone uh, for that. We took a little bit from ISTE. Uh, we took a little bit from other schools that have already started this as well, too. And then we continued building it. And I'm happy to say, um, with the, um, the Ohio Department of Education rolling out the uh, Future Ready um, piece, um, Pickerton Schools is actually going to be the model school for the, 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 uh, the technology plan. And, yeah. and I want to speak to that. I think um, Pinkerton might be the model school and the model program for districts and buildings that want to do mm -hmm. what, their build what his building did or the district did. And for districts that um, have similar contexts, right? Schools have, there's tons of variables involved. And um, most importantly, we need to 
um, empower our educators and our leaders to really articulate what do we want to do and let's find some models, be it Pinkerton or someone else, that can at least inform our reaching of those goals. And I completely agree with you, but our plan worked for us. Our plan's not necessarily going to work for every school. It's a starting point, and I encourage folks to go ahead, take our plan, roll with it, but change it to make it work for your teachers, your community, and your, and your kids. Questions from the audience. I'm particularly interested in what teachers think about all this. Uh, there's a microphone there. Hi, I'm Maria Said. I'm a technology teacher at Hilliard City Schools. Um, and so I came 11 years into the classroom and then switched over to technology. And we too are a one-to-one -one district. And I think the biggest part of our success in our district, we have about six, between 16 and 17,000 students, is the buy-in, the buy-in from the parents. We have, by being one-to-one, -one, our classrooms are completely open. Parents can see the content that their children are seeing every single day. And we have lots of parent forums, even after the fact, after we established our program, lots of forums to teach digital um, citizenship and how to help their children navigate this. But also teacher buy-in, providing that professional development, because you have people that have been in the classroom for 35 years that might be gung-ho or might be scared you know what? So the, the buy-in there between the teachers and then the support from administration is by far, I think, one of the biggest things to give the teachers the professional development, provide, like our district does, a technology teacher in all of the buildings to support the staff and to support the professional development. Yes, sir, back there. Christine, to your right, or now your left. It seems to me the bottom line is whether the digital classroom improves learning across the board. Do you have data that shows that? And if so, do you have data that shows the digital classroom improves, improves learning for low income students as well as upper middle income students? Right, the equity question that we were talking about. There's definitely data on uh, studies that have been done. I would not say across the board because again, um, our communities, our schools, they vary, right? Our, our, the specific needs and goals that we're trying to reach, they vary. But we do have evidence of ways in which uh, technology can be used for various purposes to raise achievement, to increase student motivation, to empower students to take more ownership over their learning process, to con uh, connect with communities. So there's, there's examples. I think what we need, uh, so often, a lot of schools, unfortunately, or administrators, hear these success stories, and they don't realize, again, what Brian's district and some others have really gone through in order to reach these um, impressive outcomes. So we need more, more stories, and we need uh, to share these conceptualizations. There's actually um, which, rich ways in which we can um, not just get to the practices that were done, but conceptualize what happened in the organization to lead to the success. So I believe we're still really young in this process. We've only been doing this for two years now. So the data that we are collecting is we do have four different metrics that we use. Uh, one of them is the future ready um, readiness assessment, which basically tells you where your infrastructure's at, where at a global type of thing, where your curriculum department's at, so on and so forth. There's also one from ISTE that is the essential um, conditions. We also worked with a professor up in Walsh University. We rewrote the ISTE student standards into student-friendly language, and we, we give that survey to our kids every year to see how they believe that technology is impacting. Uh, their instruction, and then we also are working um, with the parents as well on a survey to figure out how they believe that it is. So we've got it from a little bit of all the different parameters, um, but when we talk about student achievement, things like that, a lot of these curriculum type things are going to take three to five years to really truly show if it's really making a difference. I will say though, some of those other points uh, that she was talking about, you know, talking about we've had ton of increased engagement. It is, it is off the charts. We've had less discipline in the classroom. Uh, we've had kids believe that they are learning things better than just the teacher covered them. So for me to get started with and where we're at right now, those three things have been fantastic and I'm encouraged to see where things are going to go in the next couple of years. Couldn't hear um, Anna's from the State Library of Ohio. Okay. Um, my question is, um, going back to the equity um, issue, 
for your 10,600 students and the students in Hilliard, does everyone have broadband, high-speed internet? And if not, how did you figure that out and what do you do for those students so that they are on the level playing field? Yeah, so we're really lucky in Pickerington. I felt bad for, for the, the teacher that was up here earlier. I think her name was Leah, where she said she only had 7%. We have the reverse. We have 93% of our kids have, have Wi-Fi. Pickerington is fully covered. Um, so basically, it's a, it's a financial issue that we deal with. Uh, so what we did uh, was we um, got in contact with a with large telecommunication company, and they were doing a grant. Um, we purchased 200 MiFi's. Um, for our district, and those are now sitting. Uh, actually, they're out in the out in the field now. But they, um, we put them in the libraries, um, and the kids that were on the uh, free and reduced lunch list, the lower socioeconomic students, they were the first ones to be able to get access to that. Um, so basically, now every single one of our kids has access uh, to, um, to to Wi-Fi when they need it. Uh, we've also worked with a lot of our different um, Chamber of Commerce. We, car we created this Pick Connect program where we asked things like they were talking about McDonald's and um, Barnes and Nobles and those types of things. Where can kids come to actually use their Wi-Fi? But then we also found out that a lot of kids can't get there. So mom works three jobs and can't get them there. So that's where the MiFi's came in at. So now we've got that. So we can say that we've licked, we've, we've solved the the device issue and the my and the Wi-Fi issue. Now our issue is the digital use, how the kids are actually using the devices in the classroom. And how do you monitor that? That's where we're getting at right now. Uh -huh. uh, that's where companies like Amy and uh, the four uh, technology coordinators that I have uh, that are out there doing job embedded professional development with our teachers to have them continue to use technology in more powerful ways. Yeah, and I'd like to add to that, that obviously not every school is one-to-one, -one, um, but for those who that are, and there are equity issues in terms of students' access, you know, outside the school day, they're extending the school day. They're providing space and after-school programming, you know, for the kids, or they're opening uh, the school sooner for students to come in and have access. Yeah, we put an access point on the outside of every one of our buildings. So during the nice months, kids can come. as a school superintendent and also uh, with the students who want to become school administrators, is Amy to you. So if I were to go to many of the 4,000, not quite 4,000 buildings in the state of Ohio, I think that I would find uh, responses that would be similar to, we're not sure where we're going, we're not sure how the equipment works, we're not sure what we want to do, we're not sure that sometimes when we start a lesson that we're going to have the support to complete that lesson. Um, what, is, what is a, a an organization, what, what would a school expect, a, a school building expect, what kind of help would they expect to get in order to implement, uh, you know, somewhat complex instructional processes that would be going on using technology? So we work in all different situations. So I think the answer depends on your building. Um, and you set reasonable expectations for that building. But I think there are ways to meet teachers where they are at and to find those on ramps, um, depending on that teacher. I think you set small expectations and reasonable expectations and you fa value those small gains. Not, I'm not sure if I'm getting quite so, so there are educational technology agencies in the state. So I am ITSCO. We are a service of uh, WSU Public Media. There are eight educational, techni educational technology agencies in the state, and we are charged with providing professional development to all of Ohio's public schools. That's what we do. That's why I get up in the morning. Now, are you technologists by training? Or are you we are all teachers, teachers, former teachers. We started off in the classroom teaching and saw what technology did for our kids and have um, become instructional coaches. Incoming microphones. <laughs> Waiting to hear from Eric. Hi, Eric Brown, again, member of the Columbus School Board. Uh, talking about closing the gap and, and equity, 
how are you addressing the needs of special education? Mm -hmm. We've got a large mm -hmm. number of kids uh, who can't use traditional computers or mm -hmm. Chromebooks and need adaptive equipment. Yeah. Computers have gotten better at serving that population, but they've still got a ways to go, and some of that equipment, some of those add-ons are expensive yeah. and maybe beyond your yeah, budget. Yeah, that's an interesting disparity to talk about, and we, we talk about other guys, but that is a real-life problem. D definitely. I, th I think it comes back to the idea that our goal is to differentiate and personalize instruction for every single kid. Um, so be it a kid that needs a braille reader or a kid that needs, you know, um, you know, tactile sensory, something like that. Um, one of the things that we've tried to do is tried to say, okay, the Chromebook is our main tool. What can we use for that? Does that student need something above and beyond that? And I'm very lucky. I actually have a um, technologist that is actually, she does nothing but assistive technology for us. Mm -hmm. So she's the one that's actually out there field testing, okay, does this work, does that work, so on and so forth. So I don't know if I have a, a silver bullet answer for you. I don't know if anybody does, but I will say it gets down to personalizing it for each kid is our goal. So if that's our goal, then we need to make resources available uh, for kids. So we have different programs for kids that are, that are special needs or that need intervention. Um, we have different programs for ESL students. Um, so for me, it really gets down to that idea. The question then goes down to is, when does the budget come into right. effect with that? And, and where are we at with that? So I, I would say we're still working on it, uh, but we do have lots of different tools that we are using uh, with kids to be able to, to, to enhance their learning. No question that you have great support in, in your school district that maybe not all Correct. districts have the luxury of. Thank you all for participating in the conversation. I know the audience enjoyed it. Appreciate it.